So the chickpea flour pancakes. Yeah. Savory? Yes. Dipping sauces? No, but it's very crispy Just and pancake. salty and delicious on its own. That sounds really good. Yeah. You didn't request sauces. They didn't have them. It was just it was just that. Wow. Yeah. No sauce for you. Yeah. The sauce boss? I do love sauce. Hello and welcome to the Worldwide Honeymoon Travel Podcast, the podcast that talks about all things couples travel, including destinations, tips, advice, and more. I'm Kat. I'm Chris. And this is episode number 196. And I am sitting pretty. Up six to two in our <laughs> World Cup bracket right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I was also uh, confident early in our college basketball bracket and I ended up having to make pastry for 10 hours. So I don't want to fall off this throne, (laughs) but I'm also feeling pretty good. Oh, good. Yeah. It's the world cup right now. And Chris is so far winning. Um, but it's pretty early days as we record this before Thanksgiving and yeah, just the second day, the second day of the world cup. Yeah. Yeah. Now I am, I I did watch the U.S. game. That was a great match. Mm -hmm. It really was. We, it was so exciting. Little, little bit of a lapse to, uh, to end in a tie, Mm -hmm. but you know, um, I am probably going to eat these words at a later date, but I'm excited for England. Okay. Yeah. I'm a patriot and a masochist. Okay. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Did you watch any of it today? No, I didn't get the chance to. I was working and just doing a bunch of stuff. Um, but hopefully, hopefully things turn around in my favor sooner, sooner rather than later. Games are on at five in the morning tomorrow. Oh my gosh! Can I? Absolutely not. I I can book you, especially when like this is kind of my last big work thing I'm doing before I leave for Thanksgiving and then the Christmas markets. What is the last big work thing? Recording this. Oh, so you're on vacation starting tomorrow. I okay. My vacation does not entail getting up at five in the morning. Uh, Four thirty. Oh my gosh! So we can make coffee. No, I was gonna work out, run errands, pack. You know those sort of things before a clean professor's like all of his stuff since he's getting dropped off at your parents. Man, like I I've got a busy day. It's just not work related because I've wrapped up most of my work for the month. I guess it's also not full of international excitement. I know. Yeah. Well, it will be when I leave for France on Saturday. So here's a question for you. Um, if you are in France, you're going to France and Germany, right? Yep. If you are in France or Germany for when they play, yeah. are you guys going to try to go to um, like a little pub or something like that to watch the game? We might. I mean, we need to warm up eventually. Yeah. Yeah. We're not just going to, I mean, we're going to be outside a lot, but we'll want to sit down and warm up. How far ahead will you be um, hours wise? Six hours from here. So at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, your time, Mm -hmm. the U.S. plays their final game of the group stage. A week from tomorrow. Yes. So we'll be in Strasbourg. Okay. Right? At 8 yeah, o'clock. we're Sunday, Monday in Paris, then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in Strasbourg. So, yeah, we'll be in Strasbourg. Yeah, because it's 2 p.m. our time. Nice. 2 p.m. So, our time. Okay. It helps being closer to, like, to where it's at, because then the time difference isn't as crazy. It's not going to be at 5 a.m. It's going to be, like, much later in the day. Now, this is, a, this, this is going to be a very foolish question. 2 p.m. here, how late is that in Qatar? Um, you know, I don't know the exact... It's either... My guess would be seven or eight hours ahead. So that game is starting at like nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night? But I also feel like when you're hosting the World Cup, your hours are a little weird too because a lot of the people watching... I mean, it's international, are, so you right. want to make sure it's like the bulk of the people watching aren't watching at like midnight That's two fair. in the morning. So I think they probably have to adjust... Like, because people in Qatar, yeah, that like an 8 to 11 o'clock game isn't that big of a deal. But, I mean, Argentina, I but believe, But then everyone, plays like, at... all the other people, like, in Europe and, like, the United States, Canada, you know, like, and most of, like, the Americas sure, will be sure. 
sometime in the afternoon. Well, so, Argentina, I believe, plays at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. That's the one that I assume yeah. that we're going to be watching together. But that's like, yeah, but it still makes sense that they're doing it that way, just based on the amount of games that they're having. And like, yeah, there are a ton of games. That, I mean, we have that we can get that for us to basically get up early enough to do that. Like, it's still manageable for people in the Americas on the East Coast. That's true on the East Coast because then if you're out in on California, imagine I guess 2 it is two a.m. But there's no like perfect time because you're gonna like someone's going to be up at two or three in the morning. I think they're just trying to like do the least amount of like sure. having to, you know what I mean? Like it's always tough when it's obviously a mean. big international event, you know? I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. I'm because excited. I will say that in Peru, we were what? One or two hours behind? One, I believe. So South America, so the bulk of South America would be closer to East Coast time. So it would just be like California and Hawaii, Hawaii what Hawaii would be like watching midnight soccer maybe midnight soccer i don't know this is uh whew. blowing my mind here no it's it's tough i mean who knows yeah and who knows what australia and new zealand are working with especially when they play when australia plays yeah all in all i look forward to watching 5 a.m soccer with you over the next few days oh my gosh no <laughs> do you have a highlight um my highlight is having all of our decorations up and we cooked a lovely dinner um we worked a lot this weekend we put up all of our decorations at our place then we helped out at our church putting up decorations and it's just been a busy weekend um so it's now monday it's the week of thanksgiving i think almost everybody is at the point where they're like it'll get done after thanksgiving sort of thing you know what i mean wow well i feel not i i'm gonna say that the week of thanksgiving nobody I, uh, people aren't trying too terribly hard, I feel like. Speak for yourself. <laughs> That's why I like, I don't know. Anyway. Worldwide then, phone it in. And then you get, no. My goodness. Well, I did a bunch of work last week so that I could relax. France laissez-faire. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. And then December, it's like just a loss in general. <laughs> like everyone's like, save it for next year. <laughs> Are you just writing off a month and a half? Oh, no. I'm still planning to work. Like. It doesn't yeah. sound like it. Yeah, but then it's like the holidays and, you know, it's just, it's crazy. I'm just giving you a tough time. Anyway, so today's episode is going to be about um, a seven-day Provence road trip itinerary. So my sister and I, in September and in early October, did a 10-day trip to France. We spent a couple days in Paris, then we did a seven-day road trip around Provence. And I'm just giving you my full itinerary, where we went to, what we did, um, all of that good stuff so that you guys can plan your own fun little Provence um, itinerary. Awesome. Can yeah. you set the stage for us? So if we're picturing France, where mm -hmm. is Provence? Provence is like in, it's, I mean, it's the south of France, essentially. The south and towards the southeast of France. It's along the Mediterranean. Um, there are several departments within there. Some areas are not necessarily along the water. Like most people tend to think of Provence, the French Riviera. Um, but um, cities like Aix-en-Provence, Avignon are in the middle of the land there. And then you have the villages of the Luberon, um, which is a beautiful hilly area um, to go and explore also in Provence, but it is not near the beach or anything like that. Are we talking more south central or more over towards Monaco, Italy? Um, both. Okay, so like it's, it, it's the entire region. Yes. I mean, Got it's it. not the entire southern portion of France because there is another region that does butt up to the Mediterranean, but is not considered part of like the French Riviera. Okay. Um, but it is a huge chunk of it. Awesome. I think when most people kind of use interchangeably, especially Americans, Provence and the south of France, even though you could be in the south of France in a different region, but cool. most most of it is Provence, that area, that region of the world. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about this uh, seven-day itinerary here. And do you have any questions before I get started? No, but I probably will ask them as you move along. Okay. All right. Well, day one is getting to Provence, uh, and we started in Avignon, which is a beautiful, beautiful limestone walled city um, that is kind of centered around the Pope's Palace. So I will talk about that in just a minute. But um, Avignon is a fantastic place to start to sort of base yourself. There's a lot of cool stuff in the area. And we decided to take the two and a half hour train from Paris to Avignon uh, to get there. 
And when we arrived, we got our rental car. Um, I will say that I've mentioned this in my Avion episode and the rental car episode, but make sure that your rental car pickup train, like if you're getting it at the train station, matches the train station you're getting into because Avion apparently has two train stations. There is the city center one and one just outside of the city that's bigger and it's called the TGV and um, that's where the rental cars are. And we went to the wrong one when we came in and then had to take an Uber over. So just bear that in mind as you make your plans. So you don't have to Uber over, just take, go to the direct TGV station. Um, after we got our rental car and got settled in, we grabbed some lunch at Cafe St. Jean. It's an adorable little cafe on a square, lots of great outdoor seating and people watching. Um, the Tower of St. Jean is in the middle of the square, which is also really pretty. It's close to Les Halles, which is the big market there. Uh, but we sat there, did a little people watching, a little rosé drinking, and had our lunch. Um, and they had a great goat cheese salad and an apple dessert. And um, I got some linguine. So you can get like a little um, prefix menu or their kind of formula when it's midday. So it'll be, um, they have all these different options where you can get like an entree or a main dish and then a main dish or dessert, or you get, um, your appetizer plate and dessert and it'll be a set price and they'll have certain options for that. So that's very common in France to have. Um, so that's what we did. We went to Cafe St. Jean. Then we did a little shopping in the city cause we found some cute shops, um, especially this candy store called Autrefois and it has a lot of wonderful Provence candies as well, especially Calisson, which are these adorable um, kind of almond paste with melon and orange peel and all of that stuff in it. And it has a white, it's, I guess it's made of a paste from all of that. And then it has a um, royal icing on top of it. And it's very, very delicious. Were these the tiny little things that you brought home? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we kind of just walked around a little bit. And then from there, we um, took the car over to Pont du Gard. And that is an amazing, amazing um, ruin. It's not even really a ruin, but it's from the first century AD. I think it was built around 30 or 40 AD. That's incredible. Um, It was built by the Romans. And it is in really good condition. It crosses the the Gardon River. Um, And it's a first century aqueduct that used to carry water to what is now present day Nîmes, Nîmes in France. And beautiful, very well preserved. It fully crosses the river. You get to walk across it, not the actual um, bridge itself, but you do get to walk across the little bridge next to it and witness all of it. You get to witness the sites of the Gardon River. It's a great area to, if you want to bring a picnic there or just walk around, you can walk around the river. There's lots of great hiking trails. Um, we just didn't have time for that. But if you want to make a whole day of visiting that, you could. There's even a prehistoric cave you can spot. Um, all really, really cool things. So head out that way and then come back and grab dinner. And we grabbed dinner at the Hotel La Mirande which I've mentioned this in the Avion episode. I absolutely love this place. Um, Beautiful five-star hotel, but you walk in and you feel like you have stepped back in time into the turn of the century Downton Abbey-esque because it is very decadent looking and turn of the century decor and furniture. Very, very beautiful. Um, They have a Michelin star restaurant there. We chose the La Salle à Manger, which was the um, less expensive version and um, which is not their actual like Michelin star restaurants. We ate there and then we went to the bar after and um, at that hotel and got to sit in their salon, which was super cozy with a little fireplace and all those beautiful chairs. It felt like it felt like drinking in the Downton Abbey like living room or their like or basically being at a museum and drinking sitting on the furniture that's roped off. That's kind of what it felt like. Um, So a really cool place to hang out. And we hung out there for the rest of the evening before going back to our place. And it's right next to the Pope's Palace. But that wraps up day one. That was a big day. Day two is exploring um, Avignon and then heading to Chateau Neuf de Pop. Um, We started out, we grabbed a little breakfast, a little coffee, a little croissant at uh, at a little bakery nearby. And then we went over to Pont de Saint-Benizet otherwise known as the Pont d'Avignon. And this is a bridge that sort of halfway comes up the river. It, um, it 
is I think it was built in the 12th century and just war and sieges sieges over time have kind of destroyed the bridge so it is only halfway built across the river and it's a beautiful place to go and check out and I recommend that as you're going there we went pretty much as soon as it opened so there weren't that many people up there um go on ahead and buy this combination ticket for 17 euros it, that includes the bridge the pope's palace and the pope's gardens because you're going to want to check all of that out this day that's kind of the biggest attraction in Avignon is the pope's palace so we just bought that while we were at the bridge we walked along the bridge um it comes with a little audio guide that you can listen to and see the different points of the history and and things there after that head over to the pope's palace and this was a big place between 1309 to 1376. It's where seven popes and two um, of the papal schism popes um, lived before they went back to Rome. Um, this was all due to some civil unrest that was happening in Rome. They left. They went to Avion for a time. Then they came back to Rome. But it's this beautiful, elaborate palace. And I really think it's cool that when you get there, you pick up a histopad. Um, so it's a little iPad looking thing with headphones and um, it's in different languages. So you tell them what language you want and you basically will hover it over like a little reader, card reader thing in each room and it will pop up with some history and background to it and then also show you what it looked like back in its heyday, which was really cool. I think that is a really neat feature. It is a really cool feature. We saw that in a couple of places um, when we were in France and I mean, first of all, it's, I'm sure it's much cheaper than renovating all these places to look exactly like it used to. Sure. But also it's really neat. And it's kind of funny because you see everyone just hovering like their histopads everywhere and then like just spinning around the room with the histopad. And it was really cool. But I mean, yeah. with a lot of museums like that, too, like it's they'll generally describe it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if you look to your left, you'll see the chair and this is where blah, 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 blah happened. Right. Mm -hmm. But to have like a visual depiction, I think is pretty neat. Yeah. No, it was great. Um, after that, we went to the Pope's Gardens, which are part of the palace. It's a beautiful area. They even have sun chairs where you can just go grab a sun chair and sit and hang out, which is nice. Like they don't rush you through this at all. Um, so, And it was really beautiful. It's very sunny. It's just a peaceful area to just go and kind of hang out. And then after that, we went to Les Halles, the market, and that closes, I believe, at like 2 or 2.30 in the afternoon. So we just grabbed a quick lunch and some provisions like cheeses, some wine, um, different things, fruit and veggies and stuff to eat for dinner later that night since we were staying in an Airbnb. So we grabbed snacks there, dropped it off at our place. And then we went um, to the Avion Tourism office to catch our wine tour of Chateau Neuf de Pop. So we did an afternoon tour um, of the wineries here. And Christopher, you know Chateau Neuf de Pop. It's a combination of Grenache, Syrah, Mervedra is usually what it is comprised of. It's a beautiful area, lots of vineyards, and with, a, with castle ruins as well. Yeah. Now, yeah. you've been to a few wine regions within France. Mm hmm how did Chateau Neuf de Pop compare? Oh, it was, I mean, it was great. I loved it. It's very beautiful. I would still say Burgundy is like the most scenic I've been to. The most visually stunning? The most visually stunning. But And, and I really like Pinot Noir, so big fan of Burgundy. But Chateau Neuf de Pop is very delightful as well. And the wine is really good. So, yeah. great. Awesome. I mean, you can't complain. Vineyards are always beautiful. You know Vineyards what I mean? Vineyards are always beautiful. So, and then there's a castle in the middle of it. Like, it kind of reminded me when we went to Barolo and, and Barbaresco a bit. Awesome. So, anyway, yeah. Um, this tour that I took goes to about two to three vineyards, depending on the time. We were there during the harvest season, so the vineyards closed a little bit earlier. So, we only got to see two during our time there. Um fantastic picked up some great bottles of wine to bring home i can't wait to crack those open soon and then at the end of it we went to see the ruins of the chateau neuf de pop so the actual castle that was there in um in that area awesome yeah and chateau neuf de pop actually means new castle of the pope in english so fun fact and then for dinner we ended up just eating our provisions that we that we purchased at les Al and dancing around our apartment to lizzo so it was a good time i love um, how you're calling them provisions provisions 
Um, day three is kind of our day where we transition from Avignon to Aix-en-Provence. And this was a day, we talk about this in my Luberon episode, the Villages of the Luberon, which you guys can go and listen to. So just a quick recap. Um, we got up, we went to Sinac, Sinanac Abbey, um, and then we went to Gourds. Uh, then Apt for the Farmer's Market, Roussoulon for the Ochre Path Hiking Trail, and it's just a beautiful city, um, Bonneyou to visit uh, Chateau Le Carnagou, and Le Merron to visit Chateau Constantin. So we went to a couple wineries while we were there, had some rosé. And then we ended in Cucuron, which is a beautiful little village with a fountain in it. And it's just absolutely stunning. And then we ended going to Aix-en-Provence. So we sort of used the villages of the Luberon um, as a transition day from um, Evian to Aix-en-Provence. And I mention all those details in the blog, or not, sorry, in the podcast episode about it. Anyway, so that's pretty much most of what we did um, that full day. So day four is Aix-en-Provence and Cassis. And we happened to be there, I believe it was a Sunday. So we had all sorts of beautiful markets going on in Provence, or in Aix-en-Provence. Um, there was a flower market. There was a huge antique market and a food market all going on. So we explored all of that while we were there in the morning and had some breakfast before heading down to Cassis for the afternoon where we predominantly, this is a seaside town on the French Riviera area. Um, it's known as the poor man's Saint-Tropez, which I find surprising because it's a very beautiful town on its own. Have you been to Saint-Tropez? No. Okay. We did not get to go there this past trip. So Fair enough. Next I, was, time. I would be curious as to like how they compare. Yeah. Because there's other places too that are like affectionately called the poor man's blank. Mm-hmm. Right? And... I mean, I cannot think of a specific one right now, but generally they're very beautiful in and of themselves. Oh, yeah. And I mean, it's, I think that more people know about Saint Tropez than they do Cassis. So it was much more locals, that sort of thing. Um, we caught a boat tour um, to Calanques National Park, and Calanques are these big, they're steep cliffs that sort of form a big gorge that is full of water from the Mediterranean Sea. So it sort of forms these creeks that go inland with these big cliffs on the other side. Um, and you can hike around the Calanques, bike, rock climb, uh, go diving, lots of things you can do. But we just took a boat tour. Um, it was about an, a little over an hour long. Um, and we got to see five of these little creek Calanques is what they call them. Um, and you can just buy your tickets in the port of Cassis. Um, there's a little booth where you can buy it and then you just hop on the boat. And yeah, I highly recommend doing that. Um, the tours are in French. So just be aware. It's more of a local thing to do, um, or local visitors or French visitors. Um, still really fun. Absolutely stunning to go cruising out, um, in the Mediterranean and getting to do that. How much of the tour were you able to understand? Uh, just bits and pieces. I mean, it was a very, I will say that um, the water was very rocky. Okay. And so we would get splashed a lot. And the captain, he, he was very funny. But like, he was just talking a lot about like, next up, like, hold on. You're like, it's going to be these things. And he was like cracking jokes about like the waves because a lot of us were getting wet um, or running inside of like the cabin part of the boat instead of sitting outside because it was very rocky. Um, so it or, was not a recorded tour. No, or it was the captain script. who okay. was actually like talking about it. Um, oh, that's neat. Yeah. So I kind of understood bits and pieces of what he was saying, but um, you know, it's just be aware. I mean, it's cool. I really enjoyed it. I highly recommend going to do that because you're also going to a national park, which is pretty cool. Um, but after that, definitely explore the port of Cassis. There are beaches there. Um, I really liked Place du Bestuon, um, which was beautiful for sunset. And then we also um, went to another small beach next to the where we parked our car. Um, all beautiful, crystal clear water, not that crowded. Um, bear in mind, it is like late September, early October, but beautiful place. Uh, we actually fell in love with Cassis, my sister and I. I think that was our favorite place that we visited on our trip. Like we both were like, I could just come spend a week here and for a beach vacation, you know, during the trip as a whole or during this seven day period of it. I would say the, well, I would say this part of it. If you're going to Provence, got it. 
Yeah, so we enjoyed Cassis, and then we went and grabbed dinner in Aix-en-Provence and wandered around the streets um, in the evening, which was lovely. Um, and then we went to bed because the next day we continue our road trip on uh, to Cannes, which was day five of our trip. Um, so we went and picked up some um, some coffee and some croissants, obviously, for the road and then headed to Cannes. And um, yeah, we just kind of walked around. We walked along the Croisette Promenade, which is where a bunch of the beach clubs are. So we just kind of wandered around there, enjoyed looking at the beach. Um, we did a lot of window shopping because there's a lot of luxury stores in, Pro- in uh, Canned. So yeah, we did that. And then we um, wandered up to um, the... Eglise Notre Dame d'Espérance, which is on the top of this hill. And that is where we watched the sunset and saw the can sign. Absolutely stunning. The bells were chiming um, from the from the church. And we turn around and you have this beautiful view on this hill of the sea and can. It's absolutely gorgeous. What is the can sign? It's just a sign that's like says can but it's really big is it like the cleveland signs yeah okay got it It's like a big sign that says can on it and it's on the top of the hill and it's very beautiful so we kind of wandered around there um and the area called the suquette neighborhood um it's kind of looks like a little alley and there's all these little restaurants tucked away bars and restaurants on this alley so that's where we went to for dinner at a restaurant called restaurant michaela Um, and i really like that area so instead of in Cannes, there's tons of restaurants near the port and along the beach. Skip those. Head up to the Suquette neighborhood. You're going to find some great food um, in that area. And it's a really cute area to just walk down because it's a little pedestrian alleyway um, with all these restaurants with indoor and outdoor dining, which is lovely. So anyway, then day six. This is a very simple day for us. We have been go, go, going the whole time. We just had a beach day and it was lovely. Um <laughs> We hung out at the beach. We went to one of the beach clubs called La Plage du Festival. And um, that can cost for, we rented a chair for the day. Um, Usually in the high season, it's between 40 to 70 euros for the day, which includes an umbrella, your chair, and a towel. Um, Is that per person? That's per person. Okay. And luckily, they had changed it literally the day that we got there to 25 euros um, for the off season. So we got quite a discount and they have lots of great drinks and food and all sorts of things going on there. So we mostly spent the day because it's open from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at this beach club when we went swimming, read, ate and drank and just had a really good time. So I highly recommend that. And then we just went to the Suquette neighborhood for dinner that evening because it's too crazy along the port and, and stuff like that. But Highly recommend uh, booking a chair at a beach club and you just you have your chair to yourself. You've got space. You can the beaches in Cannes are very unique because they're very sandy beaches um, or at least the Quasette area um, where the beach clubs were. So highly recommend that. And for our last day, which was also our last day in the south of France and in France, um, we drive to Nice uh, and we went to go drop off our rental car uh, because Parking in Nice is a nightmare. So we were like, let's just drop off the car and then head into the city. Uh, We took the scenic route instead of the route with the tolls that's very fast. We took a little bit of a longer trip down um, and that drives along um, the coast where we pass through Antibes and Cagnes-sur-Mer. So some cute towns along the way, along the beach. It was really beautiful. Uh, But then we got into Cannes after we dropped off the rental car and got in and we walked along the Promenade des Anglais, which is this walkway that goes along the beach. And then we, of course, headed to the Cours Salier Market. So we went to the big market that is there in in, um, Nice and got um, soca, which are chickpea flour pancakes and did the last of our little shopping and just enjoyed our time um, at the market. So the chickpea flour pancakes. Yeah. Savory? Yes. Dipping sauces? No, but it's very crispy Just and pancake. salty and delicious on its own. That sounds really good. Yeah. You didn't request sauces. They didn't have them. It was just it was just that. Wow. Yeah. No sauce for you. Yeah. The sauce boss? I do love sauce. Um, but yeah, we wandered around the market and then we ended up climbing up the Colline du Chateau, which is the big hill uh, with a waterfall and beautiful views um, of the harbor as well as the city itself and um, the Mediterranean. So we went up there, saw the views, saw the cool waterfall. 
enjoyed our time, and then we wandered along the beach and got some room service before our trip home because we were pretty tired after that point. That sounds like a wonderful week. So that's our seven days. So we've got, uh, we did Avion. We did an Avion Chateau Neuf de Pop. Um, then we headed to the Luberon. Then we did Axon Provence and Cassis. Then we did a couple days in Cannes and ended in Nice for our itinerary. What was the best thing you ate? Oh, man. Oh, it's so, there's so many good things. Have to pick one. This is tough. Mm. Like the one, like if, if people are doing this, the one place that they should go to get the one thing. The one thing. Okay. Man, honestly, the food at um, the Festival du Plage in... Um, oh, actually, so between that. So the Festival du Plage had great food. Um, also, Hotel Michaela. The, the mackerel. The mackerel was amazing. Is that I, the one thing? Yes, I would okay. get that. The, the fresh mackerel was delicious. Okay. Yeah. Um, was there a winery on your tour that stood out to you? Um, I would say, I think it's called Le Brat okay. in Chateau Neuf de Pop. And that's the one I brought quite a few bottles home from. Okay. Yeah. Red, white? Uh, red, because it's Chateau Neuf de Pop. The Grenache, some raw, they, might, they make white Chateau Neuf de Pop? No, they do. I just brought home like Oh, okay. Got it. Got the it. Red is more common for Chateau Neuf de Pop it than is. white. Yes. yes. Um, what about the one thing, the one experience mm -hmm. that was your favorite? I mean, I would say, I would say my favorite thing that we did was our like half day trip to Cassis. Okay. I don't know. That's tough. Cause that was really cool. Going to boating around the Kalanques was cool, but also the Luberon villages were pretty awesome. The it's one really thing. Tough. Oh, okay. All right. If I have to guess, I'm going to say the day we drove through the villages of the Luberon, which we have a full podcast episode about yes. um, just a couple of episodes before this one um, that talks about everything we did that day. Awesome. I think Go listen to that one. Yes. And we weren't there during lavender season. So I'm sure if it were lavender season, which is mid-June to mid-July, it would have been like amazing but it was also amazing without the lavender what was the most visually stunning thing that you saw Ooh, i mean i'm gonna go with the luberon not the pont garde that was really cool but like when you go to roussillon and you have these ochre colored cliffs and hiking around that that was really beautiful it awesome. looked otherworldly all for right sure. yeah there it is there it is, guys. This is a seven-day itinerary for the south of France. Um, but if you guys have any um, questions about it, feel free to let me know. You can reach out on WW Honeymoon on Twitter, um, Instagram at Worldwide Honeymoon, or email cat at WorldwideHoneymoon.com, and I will link um, my full itinerary for the France Voyager post about this um, in the uh, notes for this episode. But... Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thanks, guys. Thanks for tuning in. And don't forget to rate and review our podcast. It takes less than a few minutes and really helps other people find us. Also, if you're enjoying this awesome free information on both the blog and podcast, when you're booking your next trip, head over to WorldwideHoneymoon.com slash resources and use the links provided. We earn a small commission at no cost to you when you book through these links. And these are all brands and companies we know, love, and use, like Skyscanner for finding the best flight prices, World Nomads for the best travel insurance, TripAdvisor for hotel bookings and reviews, and even Amazon for all of your travel purchases. Thank you for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Wherever you are, wherever you go, remember to make every day a worldwide honeymoon.